it's an Archeo Death interview with Professor Howard Williams and his guest. Hey, hey, how are you? There you are, hey. with the case. <laughs> Let me just uh, find myself. I managed to do all that, but I forgot to find the notes I had all prepared to discuss with you, and now they've disappeared into my the morass that is. <laughs> ah, no, I found them. Here they are. All right. How are you? All right. Um, crazy the last month. <laughs> well, it's, it's delightful after all these years of being on the app together to finally have a chance to have my phone fall over in front of you. No, um, well, let's just stabilise this. Right, okay. <laughs> to to get to have a chat. It's uh, it's been great, and uh, uh, to to see many of your videos. I've just been avidly rewatching a lot of your last year and a half's content to catch up with all things in bjorwin world <laughs> um and uh it's uh, you know and um, thank you for the uh invite to or the the suggestion of going live this weekend i, I think it's going to be it'll be an interesting chat it's an interesting subject because it's something i've been learning about as i've been going along and uh you know um you know i, I just would love to hear your perspective on everything um I, I don't know um should i give our viewers a bit of a context to what what this is about and what we're going to be discussing or do you want to start off and introduce yourself or how would you like to go ahead i'll, I'll introduce myself to the people who aren't familiar you got a bigger following than me now <laughs> <laughs> um yeah as uh i've been doing living history for for years now and and of course that is very much involved in engaging um the public pretty regularly in regards to uh history and archaeology and everything especially since a lot of the stuff we have is is historical uh um, reproductions or, or approximations to actual, um, you know, artifacts and so forth. So, so we're going to be talking about the various issues regarding, um, public engagement, especially with, uh, in, in relation to various Viking events, uh, that you might find living history and stuff at. Exactly. And it's something that I don't have a vast amount of experience of, but I've long met, um, you know, living history, performers, proponents, uh, enthusiasts, or I don't know what the best term is without sounding rude or patronizing, but living historians, I suppose, is the, is the way to call it. Um, uh, and I've, I've been, uh, I did some collaborations with a couple of um, uh, chaps in the, the UK at the Hesham Viking Festival from 2017, 18 and 19. And then I went back this year because they had the COVID break and they, they came back, uh, but I, I wasn't involved in any formal way. But it's a topic that I brought up on social media because I was reacting to the good Stefan, who is a, a Norwegian archaeologist and who was making a bit of a dig at these more fantastical, you know, events. And I don't want to talk about that particular event because I don't know much about it other than I shared his, you know, his concerns. But my point, I suppose, was saying, hey, any event you hold, academic conference, public event, any kind of reenactment event or living history event is going to potentially be open to a particular, you know, extremist element. And I suppose the question, the point I was trying to raise was, this is not something we can easily, you know, just dismiss the more fantastical elements. It, it, it's a bread, it, it's potentially could appear in many different guises and many different ways. But I mean, I'd love to hear about your perspective and experience, because obviously I haven't been to the States and uh, seen any of the festivals there. What are they like? I mean, have, have you, uh, at what scale are they at? And you know, what, what goes on? <laughs> it's, um, it, it kind of varies. Most of the time you see living history, it's not like a Viking specific thing. There are a few Viking um, festivals but it's more like there's a, a living history component at a festival that might engage with, with a particular topic. Like there's the Southern Maryland Celtic Festival that I'm at year after year, um, in which we do things like the uh, um, uh, Vikings in Dublin and stuff like that. Though this past year I was actually Roman, had to be a little weird this time. Um, the, uh, um, there's uh, Vikings Con, which is one of my favorites, and that is very much a Viking fest and they invite all kinds of people and you get um, a huge broad range of people actually uh, from the, the very fantasy uh, LARPing crowd to actual yeah, um, experts and stuff. Um, this this past year I was talking to uh, Daniel Sarah who's a culinary archaeologist if, if you're not familiar with uh, the book uh, In Early Meal which I actually have it. Oh! Yeah. I don't know that one. I'll, I'll yeah, it's, uh, 
Um, it, it, I, I joke, it's like the Bible for, for living history uh, kitchens because um, it also breaks down like things in, into regions. So you can go like, oh, this is like a, a you know typical particular cities. Like this is more common around Burka. This is more around Kapong. This is more around he Hedebi, um, Hethabu, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, so it's 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 a really great book, and I, I definitely recommend it if you want to get into uh, um, Viking cooking. Um, well, so, I you think know, uh, whether it's cooking or craft or warfare, the scale of not only enthusiasm, but the scale of knowledge of many living historians is is really, you know, you know, wows me. You know, over the years, how when I've encountered had conversations, there's so much not only individual possession of knowledge, but shared knowledge. There's a great sort of sense of community of sharing information, isn't there? Yeah, I, I joke that that some of my living history groups are just collection of power nerds. <laughs> well, some that's of no them bad are thing. Like, <laughs> incredibly educated on weirdly specific things like the history and chemistry of soap <laughs> so you know it, it can get really interesting because there's there's just a huge variety of just interesting sources of information and and do you i mean i i at least from going around stalls at the the viking festival and also i've been at a few other i i was a guest speaker at a reggio anglorum conference where they wanted me to talk about I can't remember what I talked about now, hogback stones, I think it was, or something like that. But I turned up at their conference, but it's at a conference setting, but they're all got so much, you know, every individual's got a different take and a different, you know, character and a different, you know, set of objects and interests. Um, you know, it, it you're always learning something new, I guess. Oh, oh yeah. Um, and, and a few of our, our, our uh, gr uh, events that we've done have gotten like hyper specific into um, uh, certain things. Like there's there's an event called the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival that is kind of frustrating to set up a, a living history camp in because of all the uh, fire regulations. Um, it's wild. Uh, just, they're very anxious about canvas tents being a, pro a, a flame issue, you know. Um, it was a little ironic considering, you know, wool is definitely famous for catching on fire or rather just smoldering and going out. I have tried to set wool on fire. It's hard. <laughs> but, yes. um, but yeah, you know, at the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival, a lot of the demonstrations are, are very much focused around the impact of wool, spinning, weaving, um, sail making, uh, cloth making, um, and the trade and everything that uh, blows up around that. You so you're really adapting, easy. You, from what you say, you're adapting what you do to which festivals there are. So though you're, you're interested in Norse and Germanic heathenry and societies, you're happy to just do a bit of Western Britain, I saw in your recent post and your helmet there, you, because of the Celtic festival. So you, you're quite yeah. adaptable, really. Is that fair to say? Yeah, well, um, uh, even the more period specific groups, you know, um, tend to tend to have to be adaptable because of the um, lack of lack of real uh, Viking focused events. You know, like I said, the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival, you got to be very hyper specific about that one thing, the Celtic Festival, the Viking events are typically, you know, like Viking settlement in Dublin and stuff specifically and related to that history as opposed to, you know, um, uh, Burka and down trade with uh, uh, Constantinople. That's not really something brought up there. But, you know, if we had a, a Russian related event, yeah, we definitely bring that up. Do you get, do you get, um, I mean, what, the, I mean, the base level of knowledge of visitors to so event like that, right? You, you're dealing with people from across the demographics of age, gender, ethnicity. What, what kind of, how do you deal with that? Because as an academic, of course, I'm always pivoting, even with one student group, people think, oh, it must be easy being at university because you've just got students and you know what they've learned. They don't remember half of what I told them even the week before, but when you're dealing, but that's one challenge, but when you're actually out there, at an event, you know, anyone could turn up. They could be an expert in something that you know a little about, but most of the time they know nothing about what you're going to be, you know, doing. So how do you, how, what, what kind of challenges does that raise for you, Bjorn? I'm really interested in that. So, so uh, one of the things that I like to do is I like to um, dive into the um, 
uh, things that are going to be somewhat familiar to people as, as, as a place to meet them that most people are going to have a little bit of base knowledge on. Um, like when talking about Viking cooking, I might bring up, you know, if you're familiar with crock pot cooking, most people are. And, you yeah. know, I can branch off from there as a, as a base point of knowledge. Um, or like when I was doing uh, the, the late Roman stuff, it was uh, very uh, specifically focusing on 5th century Western Britain. So, of course, we talked about Arthurian myth, um, you know, yeah. and... Uh, sometimes with food, it can get really fun though. Cause, uh, um, uh, uh, like, um, we have a, a dish. It's like, a basically a salted meat with, um, turnips and, and, and carrots and, and cabbage and stuff. You can compare it to like corned beef and cabbage, which goes over really well at the various Irish and Celtic festivals that you might end up at. So, um, what I mean, I actually thinking about I've never thought about this before, but so correct me if I'm wrong, you know, as with everything I say, because I'm just trying to think through things. Uh, almost, I would imagine if I was dressing up in doing some early medieval Western Britain and I can go, Arthur, but everything you think, you know, from the films is not what we're talking about here. We're talking much earlier. You know, you've got a kind of an easy setup. This is not this is not the this is not how it was. If there was an Arthur, you know, you can always do. Yeah. And then you, you're immediately into explaining to them about West, you know, Southwest Peninsula, Wales, you know, the, the, the old north, the Henogleth. You can talk about that and you can talk about that very quickly into this Magian society is no longer part of the Roman, Roman province. And yet there's Latin culture, there's Celtic culture. Um, is that easier than actually, I, I'm, where I'm going with this is actually on reflection, isn't that actually easier to introduce to people than maybe the Anglo-Saxon Viking worlds or, I don't know, I, I'm just interested in your thoughts. Weirdly, the TV show Vikings is uh, as no. inaccurate as it is, um, it is actually a pretty useful tool due to its popularity. Um, of course, we're in a different world now, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, you can, you can bring up, you know, it's like, you're familiar with this element. I end up having, I've, I've forced my, I'm not a huge fan of actually a lot of medieval TV. Um, <laughs> actually I'm, I'm a Star Trek nerd through and through. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I forced myself to watch through, uh, the TV show Vikings and the last kingdom and so forth to help build up. Um, you know, uh, familiar uh, reference points in which I can bring up things and discuss things with people. Well, actually, you're, you're, that is, I mean, I must admit, I did enjoy some of it, but almost like in spite of myself, and I'm, a lot of it was hard watching, but I felt I had to watch just to know what the shit is. And I did blog posts about them just to help digest my thoughts, but some of it was so painful. I mean, actually I prefer Vikings to the last kingdom, but some people get very angry when I say that because they think some, uh, but you know, people have to, but it was the costume. Some of the costume choices in both were just, you know, yeah. but also I, th I saw the, I saw the logic behind some of the plot lines. I thought, I know this is ridiculous, but I, I kind of see where it came from. And I saw how it, you know, you know, once you could sort of, in your mind, I could work out the, the conversations that led to, and I go, but but then I think, and then I sort of go away and wake up at night and go, oh God, what did I just watch? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I Star Trek is safer. I think we're in a safer territory with Star Trek. <laughs> As um. I I, I kind of like to think of Vikings, uh, the TV show, is is very much a um, a fan fiction of the sagas, which of course is. <laughs> broken from history. If you look at it as a fan fiction of sagas rather than yeah. an accurate representation of history, it's a lot easier to digest in my opinion. I, I, I think that is the way I try to explain to people, you know, what it is. I think that's a perfect, well, that's a, you said it much more effectively than I ever did, but I think that's the, the healthy way to think of it, isn't it? Is that there's stuff in there where they put some effort into trying to get some ideas out of academic papers but then they then they managed to find a way to make it so incongruous or you know and uh, the ballista bolts i don't know if you survived as far as uh lagatha's funeral in season six but the, oh, they wow. have no they, they have no ballista bolts they don't use any of these huge great roman star ballistas in any warfare that the vikings were involved with no those ship battles but they they use them to break the ice when they're burning her funeral ship 
And at one level, I'm going, this is so crazy. They must have been, I, even I didn't think of what, you know, this. You know, where could this have, and yet at the other level, you're going, but where, were they, where was this warfare technology for every other battle? If they had one of those in all the other battles, it was just like game over, you know, it's like, a, and he wins again with a slight smirk, you know, without having to fight. But no, it, it, they just reserve it for her funeral. And I'm just like, why? Anyway, but my point is, I hadn't thought of this. So in terms of the, going back to the festival context, so, Having that as a backdrop is a is a good starting conversation point, I suppose, <laughs> if nothing else. It, and it, yeah, and and with those festivals, uh, you you end up attracting like a huge variety of people. Like I said, like Vikings on, um, you're going to get a lot of people who are um, fans of the TV show and more into the fantasy and so forth. And 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 uh, well, the Celtic festival is a very different vibe because it's a uh, um, you get a lot more history buffs there, uh, a lot more people who are actually a little bit more familiar with uh, uh, history and what's going on, especially if they're wandering through the, the living history encampment, which is a little bit off from off from the center of things. Uh, so when people show up, uh, um, you know, you're, you're typically a little aware of the level in which you're going to deal with. Um, and uh, uh, at, at Kelp Fest this past year, I was talking to a, a uh, a priest who, who spoke fluent Latin and knew, you know, ecclesiastical Latin, classical Latin, and so forth, and had conversations on things like that. You see, that's actually, I mean, I was going to say to you and to see what your reaction was, that I find it very difficult to know who's into it for the history, who's into it for the faith or the spirituality, because these things blur so much. And I was thinking to ask you particularly about heathenry or paganism or whatever your preferred term is but actually behind all of this is a, a massive wad of christianity that people's either preconceived ideas or actual active practice is the christianity of the early middle ages is something they either affine to or have a stereotype of that they react against but you know either way i I've, i just want to put it to you i i've always found it in these kind of settings very difficult to work out who's there for they just like a bit of ye olde medieval -y, pre early medieval history or people have a much more you know deeper spiritual connection i mean do you find it difficult or is it clear to your trained eye that you know the different kinds of interests there are religious or historical with, with generally if there's there's a religious interest uh, a lot of people will ask they'll they'll be pretty um pretty direct about it actually um the and, and you're right there is a lot of uh, um pre conceived Christian formed ideas and, and stereotypes that people are working with, especially since, you know, the mythology and so forth is written down, uh, the, the most the vast majority of the mythology we're dealing with is written down, in, you know, the 12th and 13th century in which uh, there's there's definitely been a huge amount of Christian influence on the development of the myth at that point. Um, and that's that's what people have. That's what we're working with. So it's um, there. There's a there's definitely a, a lot of Christian lens that we kind of expect to see. You have a really good video where you address that point. I thought I would just want to say that as a sideline. That is a really good. You have one of the best sort of takes of trying to balance that. Of you know, you can't choose between which bits are pagan and which bits are Christian because it's a world where these ideas are, you know, constantly bouncing off each other, aren't they? I thought it's a really well well balanced way of saying it. Okay. How do you separate them? That's the neat part. You don't. You don't. That's the phrase you use. Yeah, that's the way you say. I thought it was a really good, good, because I see a lot of different takes on that, and I, I try not to be too succinct, you know, too, you know, demonst you know uh, um, emphatic about it, shall we say, because I think you can't be, you know, uh, it is going to be really mixed up. So so you have, uh, you know, festival events where you're different scales, different you know, the elements of bigger festivals that can be on a very different themes. So your audience is all over the show. You may have people you've seen before, but you may be dealing with people who've never encountered this period at all in their schooling or apart from maybe a reference to a King Arthur, a reference to the TV show Vikings of the Last Kingdom. What kind of things do you then do? What, what kind of how do you, is it through conversation or actual sort of more formalized you know, around the objects, or how do you talk to people about the period? What is there any set way you do it, or is it just a informal conversation? So uh, it it depends on what kind of setup I've got, because um, uh, and and 
Uh, we have people with, with displays that are some more interactive than others. We have people who are actively demonstrating like a particular craft or, or something. Um, and uh, sometimes sometimes I, I set up like a little merchant stall essentially and just harass people as they walk by. It's like, hey, you want to buy some wine? I don't take this paper stuff. And it gets people coming over and asking about commerce and things like that. Um, but, you know, if you got like, you know, if you're – you're smelting silver and got a, um, a a hammer swinging or something like that. People typically want to come over and look and see what what you're doing. Um, so you know, there are, it, it depends on you know the particular setup you have that that particular event. But you know, from yelling at people to just uh, uh, come over in a sort of in character way to to demonstrations and, and and displays and so forth, we got a lot of different ways to try and encourage people. But we also have done some some programming for some of these events where we've done um, much more involved in, um, demonstrations. Um, like a, uh, a couple years ago at VikingsCon, we did uh, a, a funeral demonstration, so to speak. And it's, <laughs> as, it's a challenge because there, there are a lot of challenges. When, when dealing with these kinds of things, There's you can't be 100% accurate. Uh, no. So you kind of got to play with you know uh what is your goal what is your intent what are you trying to get across and therefore what do you sacrifice um and when it comes to engagement like we, we obviously can't do animal sacrifice um there's animal even though rights there's, there's, there's ethics you know there's fire safety yeah. you know <laughs> um uh, and uh, somebody asked where those events recorded i actually have a pin video of a, a short synopsis of the uh, uh the the funeral for those interested in that um and uh you know we can't can't do animal sacrifice we can't burn people uh you know so cremation's out and unfortunately it means it's a less than typical inhumation burial and we can't bury them alive so uh what we came up with is is we did a, a libation offering to get aside the idea of you know the, the ritualistic offering elements we had a, a ton of different grave goods that we tried to portray um as a means of like you know, it's it's not offerings that they take with them to the afterlife necessary, but very much uh, sim symbolic of the relationships that they had with yeah. the deceased. Um, and we, uh, instead of burying obviously, we had a, a, a shield that we symbolically placed over uh, the head of the deceased. And um, because it, we had a whole funeral procession, so we started at a very different part of the festival and had a horn blowing and got people. And I also ran around beforehand and looked at people who looked like they were in reasonably appropriate kit and asked them, hey, do you want to be a part of a Viking funeral? And got them to be like pallbearers and stuff. Um, so some of them weren't actually part of the same group. They were like kind of recruited on the set, oh, yeah. you know. <laughs> Yeah, and um, there's another group there that decided to do something on the last um, demonstration on the last day. Um, they decided to uh, get all of their people together um, to uh, just create this hallway of shields as we passed by their camp, which was pretty cool. Um, uh, like nobody, I didn't tell them to do that. Nobody told them to do that. They just did it. Um, which was kind of like, um, well, not exactly, you know, something that would have happened in history as far as we're aware, you know, it's, it, it definitely, um, underscores the, the level of community engagement of, you know, this is a funeral show respect kind of thing that, that you would expect. And it helped set the mood to a degree. Um, and, that's, um, sorry, I don't want to cut across you. I'm just so enthusiastic to hear about that because that's what the lesson for me about that is that funerals are, are obviously informed by tradition and expectation but they're also just people make shit up as they go along yeah. and depends on who's there so i think that's 100 percent authentic to what funerals are in any culture is yeah. is the that mixture of organization planning and expectation but also stuff just happens spontaneously people decide yeah. to do something with shields and former you know and you know, given societies in the, as we talk about so often, both of us on our channel, that were not just homogenous single cultures, but are constantly finding themselves dealing with their culture in the presence of people who are from very different linguistic or cultural groups from around Northern and Western Europe. You know, this, this that's authentic in another yeah. sense. You, you know, you're dealing with different living history groups or sort of shoving up against each other at events. And I think that's, that's, that's actually really, I hadn't really thought about that before. That's really exciting. Yeah, and because um, you know the procession went through like the whole um, the whole festival.
Old ground. We just picked up so many people, and the mood um, was, was was a little bit accidental because the lightest person um, to carry on on the beer um, happened to be uh, one of the other uh, members of this group. Um, his daughter, um, and, and you know their parents and their daughter, and is like they're trying to not think of like oh this. They ended up very emotionally involved because it was almost like looking at the funeral of their daughter, especially since they were heathens, you know, this is, this is yeah. someone, and it was, it was a very tender and touching moment. Um, and you can see in that video where, you know, is, uh, the, the yarrow of this thing is, you know, tenderly brushing her hair. And that's, as is a genuine emotion that's happening because it's, he got in that mindset because that was his little girl. And, um, you know, and, and there, there were people in the audience, who were straight up in tears they had forgot this wasn't real um so you know it was a it was a, a fantastic um uh engagement uh with the people to get them really feeling like it's uh this is it, it turned something like most people's perceptions of viking funerals is the you know the the the, the funeral pyre on the ship out in the the water you know and and, and turning it from hollywood to something that's like real something's like oh yes this is a funeral someone uh, died. We are showing their last respects. We are we are commiserating together. We're reckoning with the new normal, um, and and we're we're making memorials for our relationship with that person. And they felt really involved, and I think they walked away with a much better understanding, and 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 in the reality of what these funerals were, you know. And it allows us to think about both the similarities and the differences between oh, the yeah. past and the present. Allows us to think about the. The fact we're all contending with mortality and even if people know this is a not a real funeral it still will touch on people everybody's there has been through their own life journey of loss and mourning for others and they will bring that to the funeral event so a one level it's not it's not fake or an act it's you know it's a continuation yeah. of all those people's experiences and i think that's really constructive to think of it that way I, I did. I mean, I love the idea of the funeral, obviously, because I do funerary archaeology and I know how much care um, living historians put into reading the academic work and the ideas it, and trying to put that into practice, not to replicate one scholar's writings, but or one ancient source's writings. You're not, as you said, you can't, even if you wanted to, you would yeah. want to do a Ibn Fadlan, <laughs> a Bulgar side funeral of a Rus chieftain because uh, a whole host of reasons, not least the burning and the sacrifice, but also the scale. But, 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 most very few funerals would have been like that in the early middle ages anyway that's yeah. in, you know um but but I, i'm really interested stepping back from the funerals about how you think about this role taking on a role i mean do you feel it is 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 calling it acting or calling it a, you know getting into a role is that does that sit well with you or badly with you i mean do you feel it's like you're taking on a role because obviously you you're on this app with not your real name you it's a persona but it's not a some people see that as oh they're just acting i mean i don't think that's probably what you would think it is do you well it it depends on like exactly what i'm doing because like there are a lot of times in which i drop the 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 thing and just talk directly to people um as you know a person to person um but um yeah when i'm i'm in character so to speak yeah i would say it's it's acting it's it's larp essentially live action role playing that's one thing that like annoys people because people like arguments like there's living history and there's like no living history is larp it's just historically informed larp um, yes. But you're 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 stepping into a role and you, and you're playing this role as, as live action in order to portray a certain thing. Um, it, it's it's LARP. It's just historically informed LARP. It's LARP with extra steps. <laughs> and uh, always... go on. Sorry. Yeah, it's just something that annoys me is a constant denigration of the LARP community. And and it's like I have nothing wrong with that. You know, if they're honest, this is fantasy. I have no problems with that. Don't denigrate that. Let them yeah. have fun. And, it, and well, it, like I said, Vikings Con is full of LARPers. So it's a it's a great opportunity to engage with people um, who are, are very enthusiastic, um, but may not be historically informed, you know? Well, I mean, I think that's the problem, isn't it? Is that every group, whether it's archaeologists, historians, academics, in other words, or it's 
living historians, we all need someone to say we're better than. I'm not saying you do or I do, but I think there's a, it's, it's a human instinct, isn't it, to go, yeah, well, I'm an archaeologist. I'm not like those prehistorians, though, bunch of wankers. You know, no one, no one likes them. They don't do real or or whatever it may be. Or pre, I know I say that because prehistorians, I know, say that about me. So, um, <laughs> you, know, you know, but my point is, you know, there's all always an us and them, isn't there, being created? Yeah. And it's easy to bash people who want to be the MCU or they want to do some kind of as oh they're not serious we're serious but it's all about play isn't it it's all about fun it's basically about having a good time and doing something that interests you isn't it i mean that, that's what moto is. you're not doing it for the big bucks you know none of none of us are even in academia but it's it's about you know it's, it's fun isn't it and it, it should we be ashamed of that Oh no! It's not. I have a, I have a huge blast. You know, um, some people don't want to take the time studying and researching. I find I find this fun. I mean, I'm a special weirdo, but you know, I find this fun. So I, 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 I love you know diving into and cross referencing books and comparing you know different sources and, and, and material to try and piece together a picture. Um, uh, and 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 the live action role play. You know, fantasy larpers. The, that's not their thing. They prefer you know playing with with you know fiction that's there's no reason to denigrate that i don't i don't, I don't understand the point I, I suppose the challenge is you know i mean when you get to thinking about challenges and problems you know you could are you can make an argument either way you could say well it's safer to play with fiction because everyone kind of knows it's fiction but some people then you always meet someone who actually thinks he's, you know uh, yeah, but then also you know you could say well it's safer to work with the accuracy with the, the the living history that's actually based on archaeological and historical information but then we know some people take that a little too seriously um so i mean have you i mean maybe you know i i, I appreciate you may not want to share personal experience but do you have any sort of sense of how do we contend with that issue because i i mean it I also want to make clear that as an academic, I have to face that kind of problem as much, but not necessarily at festivals, but at conferences or public events where someone just steps up to me and comes out with something and I have to go, how do I handle this? I don't want to get punched, but equally, can I let that go? And and how do I go, hmm, that's an interesting idea you have about ancient aliens. Let's unpack that for a second. Or I sometimes I make the decision that I just don't want to have the argument and I just go, that's interesting. However, can I just tell you about, and I just, I do a Louis Theroux and I just sort of go, yeah, yeah, that's, that's an interesting view. Yeah, let's, uh, but on, on the other hand, let's talk about this brooch, you know, and so, I mean, do, what do you do when you face that kind of, those people who are, shall we say, on the fringe or extremist? We've definitely run into, I've, I've definitely done that maneuver of just like, let's, let's just readjust back on topic here about somebody, <laughs> uh, somebody recently came up to us as like to a Viking group in a Viking event and started going on and on about, uh, um, uh, um, was essentially messianic Judaism. And it was like, where is this? What? Like, like, okay. Christianity, medieval Christian. I, I can see where you come. Messianic Judaism is just, where did you come in with this? Why are you? And, and those yeah, people sometimes are just on a mission to just spread their crackpot, And you just got to, change topics when you get to those um uh but sometimes uh when you get the 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 extreme far right um uh you, you we have a uh anti uh nazi uh flag that we we fly and and usually the kind of person that sees that and goes oh that means uh i'm not invited well good you're not invited yeah. i'm not going to talk to you um especially yeah. since we got um, we got a community to protect. Uh, a lot of my um, group, there we got a, a diversity of people. We've got you know Hispanic people and, and and black people. We got Asian people. We got all kinds of all colors of queer. Um, you know myself included. Um, and uh, uh, and some of these shows uh, and events are run by a whole diversity group of people. Like Vikings Con is run by a black woman, for an example. Um, so. Uh, you got to think about safety when you come across certain degrees of extreme is like there's no it's not worth trying to talk to them at no. when they show up at these events it's not worth engaging it is more worthwhile to get rid of them to protect everyone else because they're they are a threat to everyone else so you know the the being aggressively you know anti-nazi is and 
literally flying that flag uh, does help yeah. just get pe those people to just move on um, rather yeah. than try and engage with us. And uh, luckily also these events usually have security for when those people don't get that hint. Luckily that's never been an issue yet, uh, yeah. thankfully. Um, and there are also some groups that are uh, extremists that try and get involved in these uh, events, um, uh, reenactors and so forth that are, um, uh, how do you describe? They're, they're like fantasy LARPers who refuse to insist, who refuse to acknowledge that it's fantasy and right. it is right wing propaganda fantasy. And, right. um, and, uh, it, you, I'm involved with like the, the, the programming and the living history coordination of a, a good number of these events. And, um, and like when it, people will actually run things by me, I've, I've, I was like, are you, have you heard this group before? And it'll be like, yeah, no, just no, <laughs> do not let them do so not the accept word goes round is what you're saying. Yeah. The word goes round and people yeah. spot the, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, the community is, is definitely, um, uh, the community is definitely, uh, uh, we, we'll accept a huge range of people, uh, left, right, center, whatever. But when you get yeah. all the way to that danger level of radical right wing, um, they start sharing the word and be like, all right, you got to keep an eye on them. Um, cause you know, again, it's a safety thing, you know, yeah. it's like, cause you know, there are people of all political, uh, of, of all types across all political spectrums, right, left and, and, and in between who were, you know, black white, queer, um, pagan, Christian, it, uh, everything else. Um, but you know, that far, that far radical right extremism is a danger to all of them, you know? I, th I suppose the problem is, you know, um, there's no easy solution to people who want to infiltrate and you don't notice it till they're there. And um, this is what, when I was, I did a blog post recently reading out Ingrid Falk's piece from two years ago about how she's given up with it all because people, she, they did their vetting, they did their, I think it was some Viking hiking, some kind of outdoor exercise, and they got on this two, three day thing, having done all their checks on people's political and extremist backgrounds, and this guy is, is espousing stuff that, you know, there's no way, if someone wants to infiltrate, there's always a way in, isn't there? And that is the problem is that we can be, you can create a safe space, you can fly a flag, you can do your best and vet people. But if someone's going to deliberately hide their identity until they're two days into an event, that's going to sometimes, I mean, it may not be common, but it's going to, you know, you no single person, unless you know how to mind read, is going to be able to deconstruct that. I don't know. I, I'm just sort of throwing that out there as a, as a reflection on what she was saying. I understand her frustrations, but I don't know what else she could have done, despite obviously she felt, you know, in despair at her efforts. I don't, I don't I'm not sure I can understand what, what she could have done more, what, what these groups can do yeah. more than just say, we don't want you here. You know, and, yeah, so um, like I said, uh, if you frame everything around protecting the community, um, yeah. then it's it, it, and rather than you know dealing with, you know, extremism becomes a danger to the community. Then it's uh, uh, then it's clear once someone, if if they're they're stealthy and quiet and it's like and they're infiltrating, um, you know, and you don't notice it, it happens. Uh, but then you end up uh, the moment they say something that is dangerous, that's when you got to go. Okay, you got to leave. Um, uh, and I, it's not just in, in, in reenactment, it's in pagan communities all the time. Uh, I've seen entire yeah. communities completely fall apart because of that, or somebody has just been quiet and suddenly they started, they started inviting their friends and they start feeling confident. And, uh, it is, it is, it is definitely a danger, especially when they start inviting people, um, after they get involved, uh, and, and are, are stealthing multiple people basically, you know, and it's. Uh, and, and sometimes you just kind of got to call it quits and just let the group collapse and start anew. Um, yes. Is, okay. So it, it, that's a really interesting and healthy point. I think that, you know, yes, it's about protecting the community, but at some point the community has to accept that it's, it's not working out because of whatever dynamics, it may be personalities, it may be to do with politics. It, you know, there, there are natural yeah. endpoints to these things. And it's sad when, um, this do, you know does come about and does 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 fall apart so to speak yeah so I mean would you say that um, things you know there's there's the internal politics of groups and living history groups 
and the uh, but do you feel the the external perception is changing in a good way or a bad way i mean is there any have you noticed any demonstrable shift because obviously there's been so many headline issues with people that draw on the early middle ages to make extremist statements do you feel this is slowly destroying what you're trying to work with or is it actually a manageable problem or i, I don't know how to phrase it no, 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 way, no way i can phrase it sounds sounds good but you know what i mean i'm trying to get a sense of where do you see where you're at with the combat against these 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 outliers and these extremists how do you feel we things are going Honestly, I think in a lot of ways it's actually improving um, because, uh, like I said before, a lot of these people are, are dealing with with uh, fantastical, you know, fantasized versions of history um, rather than actually seriously uh, uh, um, reckoning with with the complexity and nuances there. They're they're simplifying it and fantasizing it and, and, and romanticizing it, and and the more um, diverse group of people that you've got coming along, the more um, people who who do who are willing to engage in the nuances and so forth those people start to look increasingly more irrelevant um yeah. as as things go on i think and and that's definitely helping a lot as as you know as people are people are wising up as they're hearing nuanced positions and ideas and and and, co and having these these co um complicated and hard conversations and the people who deal in black and white are seen as who they are is is irrelevant and inaccurate and and dealing in fantasies to support their uh their particular uh flavor of extremism you know you see but this this is the dilemma from an academic perspective i face is i've come across groups within medieval studies who are are will not be convinced that there are any living historians let alone people for adherence to norse paganism as a subset thereof or you know but obviously a different thing and an extension of that not every north pagan's into living history i'm just saying <laughs> you know that there's an overlap of four yeah. sorts there um i hope that's not an appropriate way to put it but I, you know um there's there are medievalists who see that everything to do with any living history spiritual connection to the end of middle ages is a problem it's that's all it is is a problem that is all white supremacy that is all and I, I i don't i'm sort of in a position where at one level i'm trying to obviously identify these issues and talk through these issues but i'm not trying to castigate entire groups outside of the academy not least because the ad academy is as ridden with these problems if not more ridden with these problems than the, the living history groups and faith groups so it's a bit rich you know if i were to do that but my point is I kind of see there's a lot of really constructive, you know, engagement and positive attempts to to build these communities that are not, in, in, you know, exclusive or white only or European only or faith only or any other only. They are trying to keep those conversations open. I mean, I, I don't know if it is a, a, a futile effort, but I and some people have called me an apologist for extremism because I have that stance and i don't know if you have any reflections on that because i think the fact we're both on TikTok trying to educate on these these topics kind of doesn't mean we're entitled to everyone giving us a free pass but it does show we're at least trying i don't know it's, um i think it is a bit ridiculous to write off entire groups of people entire uh, um you know hobbies or or, or religions is is a little bit um what's the, uh, What's the word? Uh, um, what's the word? Like pot calling the kettle black to a certain extent to write off an entire group of people because of uh, a, a subset of extremists uh, being a problem. It's like you, you shouldn't you shouldn't write off an entire you know religion or a religious community or a living history community because of a subset of groups. Uh, you should support the efforts of the people who are trying to rid that problem. Um, exactly. Yeah, you shouldn't see it as a. Uh, um, because because in a lot of ways their problem is your problem yeah you know 
Even some Star Wars fans are okay. No, I mean, I, I say that as a joke, but, you know, given the toxicity of some of the fandom, you know, that's, you know, as a parallel, it's not the same thing, but, you know, you know, people are rightly despairing of the level of anger about completely fictional worlds and representations. You know, it, it, it's, it's really funny, I find, that actually I've had more. When I've done posts about, like, the representation of a black character in Vikings Valhalla, the spin-off series of Vikings, I got more anger for discussing that than discussing people of colour in the Viking Age. You know, people are more angry about that, about a completely fictional. And this is a real living actor. She's she's a well-known personality. And yet people are angry that she exists and speaks Swedish and Danish and has a living life and is acting a fictional part than they were actually passionate about what happened in the Viking Age. And I, I, I wonder what that tells us. But anyway, I probably... <laughs> Her engaging you know, in a very superficial perspective of the past, I'm I sure. Think, well, that's the point. That's the point, isn't it? Is that so? I suppose the, you know, where I'm going with this is the more you can draw people into a more detail and more enriched sense of immersion, it actually can be a really constructive thing to help people to think through the problems of their preconceived yeah. ideas. I mean, you can't convert over, you know, ideologues and extremists, but at least with those that are open, surely these kind of events are more likely to recruit interest and sane perspectives than an academic conference maybe i don't know so, um, yeah, as uh, uh, it, a lot of the people in the middle ground is, is the more they're they're educated the more or they're familiar with the nuance and, and complexities of some of these issues uh the 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 less susceptible they're going to be with with the the, the propaganda so to speak you know once they realize think, it's a so. more nuanced situation, then then they hear something black and white. And like I said before, it, they're going to see them as irrelevant and fringe lunatics. Exactly, exactly. So, what what kind of lessons can we learn, and what can we do? What do you think academics can learn from the living history community, Bjorn? Because I I think it you know there's a lot you, you know you've you many of your videos you draw on the sources and the books behind you and you're very honest and clear about your sources of information you know from academics from people that are self-taught like stephen pollington through to you know historians and you know uh, the michael enright and, uh, and and you even use my books occasionally and thank you and uh, but but my point is you know it's often seen as living historians learn from the people who dig stuff up and the people who study the manuscripts but what do you think we can learn from you in terms of education you know what do you think are the big lessons that you you feel your communities can give us if that's not so, too difficult a question I'm trying to remember his name is a uh, um uh was was a um, director of exarch uh for a while i think he just stepped down is uh um this is step out of the comfort zone like it's 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 fun to like nerd and hyper fixate on some things but you just gotta meet people where they are um and and it's it's just a broad range of uh um uh, uh interests and in, you know like i said with the funeral and stuff is like it's it's things people are familiar with you know food and stuff like that things people are familiar with it it, it really helps to meet people where they are to get them engaged in thinking about things as not just a narrative of the past, but something real and tangible, you know? So I, I shall say farewell, but salute you and thank you. And let's let's continue to have conversations on, on, on TikTok and elsewhere. And I just want to thank you for your time and your insights and uh, um, respect to you. And uh, we shall, we shall, we shall Cheers, Skull. Are we allowed to do that or are we going to get attacked by us? Uh, uh, we actually have alcohol, so we're allowed to say it, aren't we? You know, Skull. Oh, I like I like to mess with people when they say Skull. I'm like, bull. <laughs> and then talk about it. It's like, do you, actually, there are a lot of drinking vessels that are underappreciated. There are, in fact, bulls. That's why it's a thing. <laughs> Well said, well said. But thank you all from the audience. Thank you all for your banter and your insights and your questions. And any other questions we have, drop them in the comments of any of my videos. And also, please, please follow Bjorn. Great creator, really good insights, and you won't regret it. But for now, thank you and good night or good afternoon. <laughs> Me the same. For relaxing times, make it Archeodeath time.